The commentary and questions are coming in fast and furiously from all over the province, which is incredibly exciting. I want you to know that if we don't have an opportunity to use your comment or to reflect on your question, all of these questions and comments are going to be collated into a study guide that will ultimately be available online. And as participants, you'll receive notice of when that's available for you to review. So the richness of the conversation that's taking place in all eight sites will not be lost. It will be captured and put into one place. But here's a smattering of the kinds of things that we're hearing from across the province. A uh, question from Jerry Lynn in Medicine Hat who asks, do you have any inclusion success stories to share of children with severe behavior concerns? Any, any quick perspectives on, on that? Yeah, and, and you know, we were talking about this over dinner last night that behavior is often the real reason why people are excluded, right? Um, it's not just the fact that they have autism, it's what do they do? Um, there was a little, uh, a mom who got in touch with me um, from rural Manitoba who told me a story about her child's center where um, her little one with autism had been attending the center from the time he was about 15 months old. They didn't even have a diagnosis yet. Subsequently, they got that. And um, I heard your table talking about the one-to-one -one worker approach. This little boy had had a one-to-one -one worker who basically became his bridge to everything that went on in the program. He was so reliant on this one staff person. Um, and he did not too bad when that staff person was there. Only one day, something happened in her life and she wasn't there anymore. She quit her job quickly. It took them a while to find another worker. Um, there was funding, but they couldn't find somebody because it was in a small town. You could make more money working at Tim Hortons than coming to work at the daycare center. So in the meantime, for about uh, six weeks, each week somebody different worked with the child. You can just imagine how crazy that made this child feel and he didn't have any language. So he quickly showed through his behavior, this doesn't work for me. And what he was doing was pulling hair. And he was expelled from the center for dangerous hair pulling. Do you know that four-year-olds are the most likely age group to be expelled, more so than any other age up to you know graduation from high school? So um, behavior is really the thing that trips us up. And now this mom needed to get in a car and drive her son to a community, you know, 40 or 50 kilometers away where the next daycare center was. So behavior is so challenging. But to come with a success story, yes. Can I just tell a quick one? And we'll go back to some of these wonderful questions and reflections. Um, my own work with kids with additional support needs um, happened at a, a, a play therapy program at Children's Hospital um, early in my career. And there was a little boy who came to our program with some real, actually there was a number of children who came to our program with really significant behavior challenges. We were the place where kids came when they got expelled from preschool. Um, that program actually has been shut down over the last few years, so there's not that as the option anymore. But we got all the hardest children. Um, there was one little boy in our program who was so physically aggressive. And he was like a little boy, but big little boy, if you know what I mean. He was like the Hulk. And I mean, I remember one day seeing him on top of the wooden play structure that was in our preschool classroom, tossing kids off the top of it like King Kong. It was really scary. Um, and his mom uh, was... Um, a biker chick. I'm just going to put it like that, okay? She was scary too. <laughs> and so she'd come to nursery school with him riding on the back of her um, motorcycle and drop him off at our program. And Jamie was his name. I can see him to this day. One of the things that Jamie really liked to do was play dress up. And for whatever reason, he would go into the dramatic play area and he would get all dolled up. And his mom was on the other side of the two-way mirror having a fit that her son was putting on the girly, girly stuff. But he would put on a little wig, and this was before we worried about lice. OK, I'm dating myself a little bit. And he had this little purple chiffon dress that he put on and the high heels. And when he got all dressed up, it was like it let his kinder, gentler side come out. And when he was wearing the outfit, that was when he wanted to sit on your lap and have hugs. And he really just calmed right down. I'm not sure what 
you know, the psychologists would say about that, but I'll tell you what, it worked. And so what we did was we allowed Jamie to wear the dress-up clothes, and he was with us for two and a half hours a day. And slowly, over the next few months, we would, you know, say, okay, you need to take off the dress-up clothes to have snack, but then you can put them right back on. And then we would say, well, you need to take off the dress-up clothes when we go outside to play, and then you can put them back on. And slowly, slowly, Jamie learned, you know, um, and he learned to kind of mm, impulse control. You know, he was able to build that over the year that he was with us. And he did actually successfully transition into a mainstream program after that year with us. And his mom settled down about the idea of, her, you know, her son playing dress up. We had many conversations about the value that boys and girls have by trying on different roles. You know, just to say, it's never a quick fix, which is usually what we're looking for. I wish I would have brought that magic wand that would fix all the kids, but the truth is, we are the magic wands ourselves, and it's through our loving, consistent approach day after day where kids know that even when they're bad, we still like them. Even when they're naughty, this is still a place that they're welcome to come. And at least each child has at least one staff person who genuinely cares about them. And to me, that's, that's the magic wand. Give it the time, be consistent, and you can overcome even the greatest challenges. Deborah, here's a really specific question from Calgary. I'm, I'm going to ask you to give a, a concise reply if you're able to. What is the role of AIDS? How can we ensure that all children can participate equitably without the intervention of an AID? Okay, um, I like to think about AIDS in the classroom as being there to enhance ratio as opposed to being there to provide one-to-one -one support. So um, that's the first thing. The second thing is I think that AIDS are often given the responsibility to care for the most challenging of all children, where the early childhood teachers who've had the background and the training get to only look after the easy kids. So there's something to me that's a little off kilter about that. And the truth is that many times we don't have the AIDS, either because we can't find them or we can't keep them. So we need to work with what we've got. And I'm going to go back to the town daycare story. They didn't have AIDS. They didn't have funding. But through the willingness of the staff you know, to break it down and figure out what do we need to do and to be a strong team together, it shouldn't be only one person's job. Here's a great suggestion from right here in the room that successful strategies can include picture communications, symbols, visual schedules, for example, are a universal, universal strategy that benefit all children and support inclusion. And here's a, a question also around gifted children. What can be done at the early childhood level to support gifted children? Is it too early? I don't think it's ever too early. I mean, again, if we think about early intervention, it works best for all children wherever they are on that continuum. So just as we individualize our program approach for kids with disabilities, so too should we be doing that with children who are gifted and talented. And I think that all too often the negative behaviors that we see, at least from some children, are signals that our program is not meeting the needs of children who are bright. And those are often the ones who show us through their behavior, this is boring, this program sucks. And especially if they've been there since they were two, how many times have they done that activity already? So mix it up. You know, I'm not saying that all children need to be taught their ABCs, like I think there's time for that and, you know, literacy in the environment, but some children really want to know that. So it's okay to work with those children and give them more. That's, again, modifying and accommodating and individualizing. And some insight from our Francophone group in Calgary who recommend that the environment for, for young learners be adapted through classroom discussions and explanation of what, what children need, that books should be shared with students on um, how, how to uh, accommodate 
uh, their, their uh, classmate, mm -hmm. and also that there should be quiet time allowed should a child need that time to regroup, and that, that there should be lots of elasticity and permission for that to happen. I want everyone here to remember those good ideas because this afternoon I'm going to show you a lot more photos of early childhood classrooms, and you're going to see examples of each of those things in the photos that I'm going to show you. And Red Deer reminds us that it, this work may require us to get rid of some of the rules. Just because uh, you should be doing certain things on the carpet at certain times doesn't mean that you can't be flexible. And I think you use the word flexibility as key to building inclusive environments. Mm -hmm. And Red Deer is echoing that sentiment. I want to remind you that these thoughts will be collated and collected. And so none of this wisdom and insight is going to be lost. Back to you, Deb. Thank you very much. Thanks. And thanks to everybody for those good um, contributions. There's such a lot of wisdom here and across your province. I mean, you know, it's easy for me to come in as the outsider and sort of talk up here, but it's you who are doing the real work. And so the chance to keep on sharing and uh, your good ideas with each other is just critical. So please do visit that website and see the rest of the contributions that will be posted there.